Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty far out in comparison to all the other talks. <laughs> um, I've been uh, excavating together with colleagues from the Russian Academy of Sciences since 2017 in southern Siberia. And uh, I've just come back from a full month field campaign about a week ago. And so everything I'm going to tell you is very preliminary. I'm trying to give you like a rough overview of uh, the history pro of the project and about the finds that we had this year. And I'm, I'm really happy to take suggestions and new ideas in because we're really just trying to wrap our head around what we found and this ton of data that we have now. So um, we started with a sort of initial question, uh, trying to reinvestigate the earliest quote unquote Scythian period um, in the Eastern Eurasian steppes. And uh, in the 1970s, uh, Gryaznov had excavated Arjan 1, this is sort of this uh, uh, really important site that kind of remained unique for a very long time, um, really defining the earliest Scythian horizon on its own. Um, of course, we have plenty of uh, later burial mounds that have been excavated in the region, all dating to Aldebel period and later, but um, from this Arjan <laughs> horizon, we really just had Arjan 1, and then since 2013, Arjan 5, um, which was only partially excavated but seems to date to a similar time period. Um, for those who don't know this uh, complex, it has this uh, really unique kind of um, radial structure of wood beams underneath it, um, which we really didn't have any other examples for for a very long time. So what we were trying uh, to do is find another burial mound that essentially dates to this time period. Well, since the 70s, we have uh, made some progress uh, methodology-wise, and therefore I think it merits sort of a reinvestigation, especially trying to figure out how uh, the Bronze Age, late Bronze Age, leads over into the early Iron Age and the emergence of the, the Scythian phenomenon. Um, there's been plenty of uh, surveys done in uh, the Uyuk Valley, the quote-unquote Valley of the Kings in Siberia. Um, one of the earlier ones actually uh, mapped out by Gryaznov himself, and it features this uh, dot, number eight, here on the map, which is uh, completely lonely on the southern bank of the river, which um, is strange, because uh, usually they you know, uh, existing in larger formations, uh, but really most of the burial mounds that we know of are on the northern side of the river. And so uh, just already its position in the landscape um, is somewhat strange. Uh, so first we looked at it uh, from satellite imagery, um, and it appeared that there's something like radial features uh, already apparent from space. Um, we uh, then went in, we did a small-scale excavation, tried to find datable material. Um, we bumped into some really well-preserved wood uh, that we were able to date to the 9th century BC, uh, which uh, was really early, it was surprisingly early, and therefore published a small paper. We also tried to check if there's anything else on the southern river terrace, and um, at least in terms of size and composition, we can say, nope, there isn't. Um, we do have a few smaller monuments uh, in the area. We have later structures, of course, but in terms of really these large, relatively flat burial mounds, there's nothing similar in the vicinity. Um, nicely enough, uh, in uh, L-band radar, which is usually relatively useless for archaeology. I mean, like, yes, of course, you can discover uh, Palo River channels and uh, investigate the Palo landscape, but uh, for direct detection of uh, burial mounds, it's not particularly useful because of its uh, rather coarse resolution. But in our case, it works really well, um, probably due to uh, the longer wavelength and, and the deeper penetration of the ground in this case. So we published the first paper and then decided to start a larger project. 
um, because uh, what we found in 2017 made us really curious. Um, this year we've done some uh, geomagnetometry on the place in order to get a better overview over the general architecture and what we found was absolutely not visible uh, from uh, just walking over the site was that it has this really nice circle uh, of stone circles around it and again um, inside the burial mound walking over it uh, with the geomagnetometer you do detect these radial structures. Um, the surface of the mound is extremely bumpy. It's very hard to conduct a geophysical survey on it. So we had to kind of help ourselves building these bridges over all the, so we could like have a reasonably uh, steady walk and nice lines going over it. And then this summer, we finally got to break ground uh, inside uh, the main burial mound. And what we found was uh, actually what we expected, uh, you know, deriving some sort of idea from Arjun 1. We wanted to find a sort of wood construction, and this is clearly it. Um, so we also have this radial wood construction uh, that we have in Arjun 1. Um, beautifully preserved wood. Uh, the one here on the upper left is um, about 280 year old uh, larch log, so that will be really nice uh, for expanding on the dendro curves um, of, uh, uh, for, for Tuvinian archaeology. But what is very interesting and what's very different from Arjun 1 is that this entire wood construction is actually covered in clay architecture. And for that, we really, again, we do not have any close parallels. Um, the main thing that we were able to come up with was Togiskan North, uh, where you have burial mounds with actual clay architecture in them, but that's fairly far away. And so currently we're trying to figure out how to draw our parallels and where to make comparisons because that seems to tell us something where like where these things are coming from. Where is this idea coming from? And that's one of the big questions we have right now. Um, of course, uh, we have absolutely no problem dating this burial mound. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of material for radiocarbon and actually uh, uh, wiggle matching, which... Um, we did with one of the, of the smaller logs um, with five dates and uh, landed with a nice date in the 9th century. So um, it still has a little bit of overlap with Arjun 1, but it seems to be slightly older. Definitely dates to uh, the right period here. Um, in terms of finds, it's very poor so far uh, on the main burial mound. Um, we have a little bit of uh, broken horse gear. We have some things that seem to date early Scythian in the periphery, immediately associated with the mound. But uh, once in a while, you bump into something that you didn't really expect. And so what we found here is actually in stratigraphic context, um, one of these Eurasian chariot depictions uh, that, to my knowledge, um, haven't been directly stratigraphically dated up to this point. Of course, we know they date to the Bronze Age, uh, through the perils that we have, uh, but it's nice to uh, find something that you can actually directly date. Uh, here on the right side, you see, uh, so this uh, uh, chariot uh, petroglyph was found broken face down uh, inside the filling of a pit, and the pit was undisturbed. As you can see, there's a whole a wooden log leading over the burial pit here. Um, so uh, we started slightly differently though 2018 because well we didn't want to start right uh, going into the main burial mound as established the things in the periphery are really important as well and uh, when you look at this picture then it's like okay there's a nice peripheral monument that is clearly indicated through the vegetation um, so we were like, yep, that's the place to start, to have like some preliminary <laughs> understanding. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, I, in that particular campaign, we did not have the money for geophysics. 
and that led to, uh, I can say, a mistake <laughs> now that I know. Because once we started opening up um, this part, uh, we had stones. And we had stones and stones and stones and it did not stop. By now, we have over 50 individual stone monuments in the Sun periphery. Um, and we've excavated over three and a half thousand square meters. We're, we're drawing close, so we, we're getting there. Um, most of it has been uh, documented and removed now. And uh, interestingly, we do have materials from the Bronze Age, uh, Okuneva pottery, through uh, early Scythian period, late Scythian period, into uh, Kokel time and all Turkey, Kyrgyz, and later. So there's this entire periphery in the south of the mound that, um, yeah, is really rich and in essentially covers about a 2,500-year-long span in time. Um, the main thing we have, though, most of the remains date to the Kokel period, which is a very local culture. It doesn't seem to have a lot of direct cultural connections uh, beyond the borders of Tuva. Um, but, uh, nonetheless, a lot of interesting stuff coming up, and I'm uh, very happy Marco made it. Um, he's our anthropologist, and he was on site this summer. And um, we have, anthropology-wise, quite interesting uh, findings. So we have, for example, this burial, where we have a really nice preserved uh, wood coffin where we have a compressed layer of wood bones and then again a compressed layer of wood. We also have this really strange crouched positions where basically in the kneecaps are on shoulder height. So it seems to have been wrapped. We're trying to uh, possibly make some sense out of that, get some fine cuts of the long bones and see if there have been uh, people working with, uh, with preserving these bones using the animal bones as a baseline. Uh, another thing we have is massive uh, trauma and violence. We have uh, really mean chops and arrowheads to the head. We have uh, collective burials where both uh, the adults have um, arrowheads in the spine, in the pelvis, uh, in the chest area, and the two children have arrowheads uh, in the skulls. So um, that is something that is very apparent. It seems to run through uh, the entire population, no matter age or sex. Um, and we have some really strange uh, kind of composite skeletons that we've come across. Uh, in uh, the left case, uh, the head doesn't really seem to fit the body. In the right case, uh, we have the head being substituted by sheep vertebra. So um, there's some things going on. And I think there, there's some parallels to Tashtik culture where we know that there have been some alterations with uh, human bodies post-mortem. Um, but this is very much part of ongoing research. Um, you were quickly mentioning, well, barrel landscapes is definitely a, a topic that uh, has kind of a wider significance. And in terms of methodology, um, and protection of these landscapes uh, is definitely something we can do. Published recently two papers, one trying to um, look into uh, how damaged these things are, trying to monitor ongoing damage, seeing if it's even possible to get a good impression of uh, the conditions of these burial mounds. And then um, just about, what, two weeks ago or so, um, we published a paper on convolutional neural networks trying to really large-scale detect uh, burial mounds from open-source satellite imagery and getting a better idea what's actually out there.